Just stretch your hands out to work, Ham, right now. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, from the top of her head to the soles of her feet. We thank you, Lord, for your anointing and your presence. We thank you, Lord, for what she's prepared in her heart. And we ask that you would place it in her mouth according to how you once said it said. We just bless her and we receive your words from her. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So if anybody's worried or wondering, every time I've touched anybody, I've sanitized. And uh, I will sanitize after holding the mic, so don't worry, okay? Um, this morning, we're going to talk about warfare. Okay, so what comes to mind when you hear the word warfare? Victory. Okay, good. Thank you. That's not what people normally say, but that's really good. Okay, who else? What comes to mind? Warfare. What? Rip, snort, and fight. Rip, snort, and fight. Okay, that's good. How about battle? Armor. Siege, armor. Good. What else? Intercession. Yes. Okay, someone, I love you. Worship. Jolene, there you go. Okay, Worship. captives, fight, army, troops, a host. All We hear all these words for um, warfare. And, but we shouldn't, or we don't, have, and we shouldn't have, prayer meetings that are so warfare-minded that what happens is you spend your whole prayer meeting talking to the enemy. Yeah. Reach. Instead of talking. Reach? Okay, I think I will. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, um, so anyways, the kingdom of God doesn't fight the way the world fights, right. okay? Right. So there's other forms of warfare too. You know what? All the sanitizer stuff, we're warring against germs. The masks are warring against the COVID stuff. But there's also other forms. Forgiveness is a form of warfare. Did you know that? Yeah. When you forgive somebody, you remove them and yourself from being a target of the enemy by keeping anger or hatred in your heart. Right. Giving, generosity is a form of warfare. Yes, you know why? It fights against the enemy telling you that there's not enough for you. That your father doesn't provide for you. So you're fighting that way. Loving people. Being in agreement when you pray. Being in agreement just when you make decisions. That's a form of warfare. Because the enemy loves being divisive. Yep. He loves being, um, he loves dividing people. He loves chaos. He loves confusion. But when you're in agreement, you're actually walking out in the kingdom of God stuff. Worship, as Richard said. Yes. Worship is a form of warfare. You know why? Worship and praise? Because all of those things make you focus on God. Everything I've listed makes you focus on God, except maybe the sanitizer and the mask. But, you know, the rest of it makes you focus on God. Yeah. And that's where, that's where the warfare is, because the Lord says the battle is His. Yeah. Right? So when you keep your eyes focused on God, what you're doing is saying to the enemy, stop bugging me. I'm not listening to you. I am focusing with my eyes, my ears, everything physical and everything spiritual in me is keeping my focus on the one who rules and reigns and is sitting on the throne, is the Alpha and the Omega, yeah. is the Lord of hosts. That's who I'm listening to today, not listening to you. Where we get into battles is listening to him. So, prayers are definitely another form of warfare. So I'm going to talk to you today about warfare praying. And in particular, this is one of my most favorite teachings that I do when I teach intercessors. It's called Warfare Praying in Psalms. My prayer mate, mentor, Agnes Dirksen, who passed away a few years ago, she passed this on to me, and she picked it up from a man named John G. Hutchinson. I don't know if he's even still alive. John, if you are, God bless you. Best teaching ever. So, um... When John studied the scriptures, he came across an interesting bit of information. I'll just read you this part out of his, out of his teaching. He said, um, interesting bit of information that although we have in scripture clear commands and modeling to directly address and rebuke demons and cast them out, which is ground level spiritual warfare, there are no commands or modeling any in scripture for, for us to directly address satanic principles, powers, rulers of darkness. That's real strategic level warfare praying. In fact, in the New Testament, you can look this up later, there's two verses that imply a serious warning against presumptuously railing or directly rebuking higher kinds of spiritual beings. Jude 8 
in 2 Peter 2 1. It talks about not being foolish. You know, um, my son's in the military, and when he got in the military, I got really interested in, I'd always been interested in war terms, but then I got really interested in war terms. And so um, he was reading, and I read this book, it's a 2,000 year old book, the 1,000 year old book called um, uh, The Art of War. It's really long, I'll tell you. Um, but was the interesting thing when you read this book, they still can't improve on it. And one of the things that really comes through this book is it says, never underestimate your enemy. Like, never treat him like he's stupid or dumb. Like, you have to have a respect. Isn't that weird? You have to have a respect for them. So the question is, how are we, how are we then supposed to stand against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, of wicked spirits in heavenly places? We're commanded to do that in Ephesians 6. 10 to 20, and Christian read that online today, stole my scripture, Christian. Um, but where does the scripture give us the example for modeling spiritual worker? Well, the answer actually is in Psalms. Did you know Psalms is one of the books that talks more about warfare and fighting than any other book in the Bible? It's almost like the art of war for Christians, you know? That's what Psalms is about. So when you go through Psalms, you're going to, and you mark every verse that is either directly or indirectly referring to enemies, um, or enemies of God's people, enemies of God, any references towards uh, references to war, instruments of war, vocabulary of war, siege, captivity, bondage. So when you go through that, there are, now depending upon the translation, because we've got many different translations now, and some of them are way more wordy than others, but I took this out of... Uh, mainly what we were using then, which was like an NIV. A new American Standard, new whatever IV stands for, can't remember. Thank you. That's why I keep my husband around. He knows all these things. See, Mike, you just keep all this stuff in your head and your wife will use you too as a commentary. So, did you know that there's 2,461 verses in the Psalms? 2,461 verses total in the Psalms. Did you know 850 of them directly deal with the enemy and warfare? So that means 35% of the Psalms is modeling warfare praying to us. Now besides these verses, there's other verses that are uh, immediate uh, kind of con in dealing with contact kind of uh, warfare verses that refer indirectly to warfare praying. And there's about 45% of those verses refer to or directly infer warfare. So that's a huge percentage out of 2,000 verses. Of, so only 25 of the 150 Psalms have any reference, um, or don't have any reference to the enemy. Only 25. That's crazy. So you want to know how to pray? You want to know how to do warfare praying? Read the Psalms. So I'm just going to give you some interesting little details because I love stats. So Ephesians 6.12 tells us we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We all know that one, right? So, but we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So you have to remember, when Psalms is talking to you about the enemy, you're not supposed to use these verses against human enemies. Because they're only to be used against spirits of Satan that are behind or working through human beings. Too many times people use warfare songs and, and direct them against people. When you do that, remember, God loves that person you're cursing. God loves that person. He said he so loved the world that none would perish. So that person that you're using those verses on is somebody God loves, so be careful. God is not willing that any person should perish, but all should come to repentance. Remember, many warfare verses do ask God to judge the enemy or destroy the enemies and not have mercy. But that, again, applies to the forces of the enemy. It applies to the forces of Satan, not to humans. Remember that the Old Testament enemies are just types. They're just types and shadows and illustrations of the New Testament enemies, which are Satan's principalities, powers, rulers of darkness. Okay, so everybody got that? Now, uh, for those of you that are real studiers, you know, I did bring all my references, and there's like about four of these, so you feel free afterwards to come up and get them, because I love it. If you want to study, you go for it. 
But let's go through this. I'm going to show you the pattern in Psalms for how to pray warfare praying. So the number one, and I'm going to, I'm going to list them from largest to smallest, and you're going to be really surprised. So number one, the largest number of psalms are those that tell God what the enemy is doing and say what he's like. So for instance, that's 227 verses, which is um, only second to, the next one is only 128. But it's 227 verses and is likely the result of spiritual mapping. How many people remember spiritual mapping? Okay, I'm older than I thought. <laughs> okay. So, I wonder why he had so much emphasis on this. Why did, why did he tell God what he already knows? Then I began to realize that this is the psalmist presenting his complaint. He's presenting his charge, his case, before the court of heaven, before the judge of heaven. He's saying to God, see where the enemy is, come and get him, God. I call you down into the battle. See where he's besieging me and come and deal with him. You notice he doesn't run out and deal it with him himself. So he initiated a case against the enemy by telling God exactly where he was. And by the way, remember that we have an excellent advocate. You know, Christ Jesus, the righteous one, advocates for us when the enemy is besieging us. You know, so it's important that we remember 227 verses. We tell, or the psalmist tells God where the enemy is and advocates for him to deal with him. Deal with him, God. The second number of verses is declaring God's sovereignty, power, and victory over the enemy. That's a total of 128 verses. And the psalmist is declaring this to himself and to the people and to God, and likely in the presence of his enemies, too. It's important to let the enemy hear you say that your God is victorious that he is going to blow him out of the water, that he is going to win in the end, that he is going to dismantle his strongholds and his siege towers and all of that stuff. It's important for that. Speak it out into the air. You don't have to start doing the dismantling. You just have to remind the enemy he's about to be dismantled. So he's proclaiming that. He's not enemy-centered. He's not problematic. He's not being problem-centered. He's God-centered. So when he's doing that, it's a stance of declaration and faith. Now, the next number of verses is when he asks God to save him and deliver him from the enemy. That's a total of 105 verses. He makes his first request and his largest. He says, this is like defensive warfare. He says, putting on the whole armor of God. Without adequate defense, you're going to become casualties, not victors. And believe me, the enemy will try. And so you have to remember, don't defend yourself, let God defend you. You know, you go rushing out in front of the troops, you go rushing out in front of God, and then you complain, oh, why did you let me get hit? And he said, because I never yelled, charge. You know, you charge. I was saying, hold the line, hold the line. I'm going to deal with them. There's a great um, scene in uh, Gladiator, which I'm not recommending you all watch it, but I love war movies, and um, they're getting ready to take on the enemy, and everything is bad, like the season is bad, it's muddy, it's starting to snow, they've gone through all this stuff, and their leader is telling them their position, they've been positioned for a strategic blow to the enemy, and you hear the leader yelling, hold the line, hold the line, hold the line because the enemy doesn't know that they're there yet. And when he finally comes charging through on his horse and yells, you know, I don't know, I don't think Romans yelled charge, but whatever they, whatever they yelled, then all of a sudden everybody followed him. Now you see, so many times the Lord's saying to some of us, hold the line, hold the line. I'm putting, I'm moving troops, heavenly troops are being moved into position to strike a blow on your behalf. Please don't go racing out and reveal things to the enemy. Like, just hold the line. Trust God. So, 105 verses, he's telling God to deliver him from the enemy. Now, remember, 227, he's telling God where the enemy is. Are you starting to see what's happening here? Warfare praying is more lining up with allowing God to fight, allowing God to do it, recognizing whose authority you're under. 
Okay, number four, the next largest, is declaring God's judgment on the enemies. This is only 95 verses, and it's a declaration of faith that he's making to himself and to the people and to God, and likely again in the face of the enemy. He's declaring God's judgment, and, he's, and hopefully the enemy's hearing him. He's declaring the judgment is both past, present, and future. That's pretty powerful stuff that we get to do. And he counts on the finished work of Christ. So, can you count on the finished work of Christ? Or do you feel like you have to get in there and just punch it up for yourself? You don't have to add anything to the finished work of Christ. It doesn't mean that you're passive. This is not passivity. This is understanding authority. And if I know, like the centurion, that's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I always tell Al, when I get to heaven, the first guy I want to talk to, of course, after I meet Jesus, is uh, I said, I want to go meet the centurion, because I think his story is amazing. And you, all of us, have to have a heart like the centurion and understand whose authority we're under. That will make a huge difference. So when you declare, not ask, not plead, not beg, when you declare God's judgment on the enemy, you'll understand that's not coming from a passive stand. That's coming from understanding authority. I can declare this because I know who rules and reigns. Okay, the fifth largest group of verses in Psalms is when he asks God to judge and defeat the enemy. That's a total of 90 verses, very close to the, the other one, 95, but this one is 90. And this request is not just for himself, but he takes it bigger. It's for his people. He's crying out for the people of God and for God's namesake. God, show yourself mighty. And this is where he begins to intercede. Now, this is offensive warfare. He's taking ground on this one. He's not being defensive. He's being offensive. I am moving forward. God judge them. God defeat them. I, Alf always loves scriptures when they could say like, you know, rip their teeth out. You no? Know? I mean, you, you got to picture a whole army of gumless guys coming at you. You know, nobody's got teeth and they're all like, Arr! it would not be so scary, right? So he's saying, he's taking ground telling them that. Christ already won this battle. You have to remember that when you're praying. Okay, number six, the next total of verses is 88, and they are declaring God's protection and deliverance from the enemy. See, he's not only asked for this, but he's proclaiming it again to himself and to the people and to God. It's a declaration of praise and of faith, and he rests in this. this is, you know, listen to that. He rests in this. I am under God's protection, and I will be. I am delivered from my enemies, and he rests in that. You know, so many of us, if we are in battles, and sometimes we get battle-weary because we don't know yet how much fighting we're doing in our own flesh and how much fighting we're supposed to be letting the Lord do. Do we really believe the battle is the Lord's? You know, what are we supposed to do? And so we get exhausted, and you begin to listen to the enemy who accuses God to us. Is he really going to help you? Is he really going to come through? Does he really protect you? Look what happened last week. Well, you know what? What could have happened if I wasn't being protected? You know, what else hasn't happened in my life because I'm protected? You know, I know I can look back over my story and think of the number of times I almost died. And every time, unbeknownst to me, because I wasn't, I wasn't a Christian until I, I was 19, but unbeknownst to me, God was stepping in every time. He was delivering me from my enemy. Okay, number six. Oh, sorry, number seven. Okay, 53 verses are rejoicing and trusting in God's protection and deliverance. See, he's expressing this to God and to his people. This is where praise and worship and thanksgiving comes in. You know, if you're not a thankful person, if you're not keeping worship in your life, if you're not keeping praise, praise builds your faith up. You know, worship changes the atmosphere around you. You have to be worshiping and praising because it reminds you who you are serving. It reminds you of the strength of the God that we're under. And it reminds everything that can hear you sing, you know, that God's the winner in all of this. And that we love him and adore him. And it keeps our focus on God when we praise and worship, right? Okay, number eight. Okay, this is only a total of 23 verses, believe it or not, but he asks God why and how long. 
And that this is the right kind of asking. This isn't grumbling or complaining. He's not always understanding what's going on and why is it taking so long. Anybody else ever been there? <laughs> oh man, so the rest of you are good? You know, there's, there's a verse for you guys too, you know. I won't tell you what it is, but we'll tell you what it is. Something about all men are liars? I don't know. Um, we've all gone through tough times and said, are you kidding, God? You know, Jonathan and Sarah went over to Zambia to adopt their boys, and they thought they'd be back in four months. How long did it take, Jonathan? Nine and a half. Nine and a half months. They might as well uh, have said, you know, God, why and how long? Because when we went, we thought, for sure, you told us four months. We'll be back in four months. Everybody was praying. Everybody was praying that there would be no corruption, there'd be no bribes, there'd be no this. Everybody, everything would go smoothly. You know, it's okay to ask God why and how long. And, you know, we might not know all the benefits of why they had to stay that long, but I know God does. I know their boys probably do. I know what it probably did for Jonathan and Sarah. Did they like being away from everybody? No. Was it hard? Yes. But, you know, we've all gone through those circumstances. And it's okay to ask God that. And maybe it's a way of letting God know that, you know what, I am, I haven't dropped the case against the enemy. I'm still pressing my charges. You know, what is holding this up, God? How long will the enemy keep pushing back against me? It's okay to ask God those questions. What's not okay is to listen to the accuser who says, God isn't helping you. God doesn't care. You're on your own, buddy. This one's on you. You know, that's what the accuser comes and says. But it's okay for us to ask our father. So, father, how long? I mean, how many of you have asked how long about this COVID thing? I have. You know, anybody got an answer? Okay, we all better keep praying. Oh, Richard's got an answer. I keep hearing the word suddenly. Well, that's good. I think we would all love a suddenly, I right? Can we all day. agree on that one? Yeah. I know people have given dates to it. Oh, it's going to start on this date and end on this date. And guess what? The date's gone by. And it's like, okay, we're still wearing masks. We're still using hand sanitizer. But the point is, we have to ask God. It's really hard for us to get dates accurately. And sometimes we'll hear things like, you know, uh, this year I heard God say, I'm going to do da-da-da. And then the year goes by and we haven't done it yet. That's not because God's not listening to you. But sometimes we, our hearing is not that accurate. So when you're getting something like that, which is like a word of knowledge, it's like a word of wisdom, you're, you're picking up something out of the prophetic, it doesn't have a time block on it. Like when you reach up into the prophetic, you could be reaching up into past, present, or future. So it's okay if you're holding on to promises that somebody told you was going to happen last week. And it hasn't happened yet. It's not about you figuring out the clock on it. It's about going to God and saying, Hey God, how long? How long should I be holding on to this? What are you doing? Okay, number nine. This is only a total of 23 verses. This is where he declares his opposition, his hatred, and his resistance to the enemy. These are the ones Alf loves. You know, the breaking of their teeth. You know, the <laughs> smashing of their mouth. You know, like he reads those ones out to me with great glee. I kind of back away slowly <laughs> while he's reading them, but he's like getting a little too happy in the descriptions. But you know what? That's what the psalmist did. You know, that's warfare. God, I mean, because guess what? When you're saying, God, break their teeth, you know, break, you know, pull all their teeth, smash all their teeth. You know, it was very hard for warriors to not be able to eat. You know, and when you lose all your teeth, you can't eat a lot of protein unless it gets boiled into gunk, you know. So guess what? When he's asking the Lord to break their teeth, he's asking him to take their strength away. Take their strength away. So you can declare your opposition, and you can proclaim that to yourself and again to God, and it's likely a part of the testimony in heaven, you know, that we say, you know, God is... I will, I will stand against the enemy. You know, and remember when I say this, it's okay to declare your hatred and your resistance to the enemy, but you are not supposed to be pointing that at a person. 
Remember, all of these enemy verses are about powers and principalities and, you know, spiritual darkness. But, you know, sometimes we get a little confused and we start pointing them at people. And that's the last thing we should do because we are supposed to love, not hate. Okay, so number 10. Don't worry, there's only 15. Number 10. He is a total of 17 verses declares that God is his shield and defender. So again, he's proclaiming God's shielding, God's defense, God's protection, his defending. And he doesn't take it for granted. He says it repeatedly about God being my defense, God being what, our high tower, God being our shield. My favorite verse about that in Psalms is the one that says that God will give us his shield of protection. When I'm feeling particularly low or having a particularly bad week, I always have this little picture in the, my mind of maybe my shield's a bit dented this week. So I'll just say, God, you know, while you're working out the dings in my shield, would you just put yours around me? I often ask God to put his shield around me. That's good defensive warfare. Okay, number 11, you call on God's battle name. Who knows what God's battle name is? Okay, everybody's like being really quiet. Okay, go ahead. Don't, don't, I won't embarrass you, maybe. Um, it is the, say it loud, stir it loud, be bold. The Lord of hosts. Did he put that up there? Oh. That's like the teacher giving you a test and the answers at the same time. Oh my gosh. Way to go, Christian. Okay, yes, the Lord of hosts is the battle name. No wonder you were all looking so confused. Okay. Okay, so that's 15 verses where he's drawing on the nature of God, the character of God part of who God is. You know who he's addressing in this verse, in those verses? The commander-in-chief. The commander-in-chief of the hosts of heaven. You know, and he is calling upon that name. You know, at the beginning, those 227 verses we talked about where he points out the enemy? When he points out the enemy, that's when he calls upon the commander-in-chief and says, there they are. Go get them. Go get them. Call down the God of the angel armies to deal with the encampments that are around us sometimes. Number 12, he's talking about Israel's failure and the defeat before the enemy. That's only eight verses. Now listen, David was a realist. The psalmist was a realist, and he was very honest, and it hasn't always gone well. Can anybody here say it's always gone well with you? Okay, so you are truthful people. I'm so happy. You know, listen, we live in a fallen world. Stuff is going to happen. And while we don't want to be enemy focused, we can't be stupid either. And you can't forget, you have an enemy that doesn't like you. I mean, I know that's shocking because we want everybody to like us. But Satan hates you. I mean, his plan is to take as many to hell as he can because he gave up heaven. He gave up being in the presence of God. You know, I have a personal little opinion that I think worship leaders, especially, your job is to bring people into the presence of God. And it says in some translations, it calls Satan, you know, morning star. And some translations have said it, it talks about him being like the worship leader in heaven. But he got full of pride. Started believing his own press. Look how amazing I am. Everybody bows down when I'm singing. Yeah, not to you, buddy, you know, it was to the guy on the throne. But what happens is, because he gave that up, I have a personal opinion that he particularly hates worship leaders. Because you are doing the job that he gave up. You are doing the job that he threw away. And so it's like every time you worship and you lead people into the presence of God, it reminds him that he has given that up. It reminds him what he threw away for pride. So that's why you so often will hear worship leaders uh, falling in sin, you know, or they get prideful and they have big fights and splits with their pastors or with their worship teams because they start believing the enemy's whispering in their ears. So we have to be careful. We have to be able to press in and remember that the successes we have are because of the God that we serve. 
the successes we release on this earth, the successes we get when we pray, the successes we get when we worship, the successes we get when we seek God in our quiet time and in our you know, um, journaling time, those successes, those prophetic words that come true and the ones that we hear and all of that stuff, successes when we pray for healing for people, that's all coming through Him. He flows because you seek Him, keep your face on Him, your eyes on Him, it comes through him to you and out to other people. But it's always his victory. And we joyfully get to participate in it. Isn't that awesome? And so if nothing happens, guess what? You get to go back to the Father and say, so what gives? I thought you told me to pray for that person. Yeah, I did. They didn't get healed. Yeah, that's not your responsibility. I just told you to pray. Okay? So it's okay, defeats. I was telling the uh, words and knowledge class uh, when we were talking on healing the other day. A good example is uh, I was supposed to be praying for people at this big conference and it was overseas in Venezuela. And uh, um, the man that had organized it had said, I thought I was just supposed to train everybody else to pray for the sick. And then he says, Pam, we really need you. You need to get in there and pray for people. And I will be honest and tell you, this was probably about 15 years ago. And I would say this all the time. Now you figure out for yourself who I was listening to, who I was in agreement with, and who I was believing. When I would say to people, I suck at praying for healing. You should go see somebody else. I really suck at praying for healing. I'll go get so-and-so to pray for you. So who do you think I was listening to? Yeah, but how many of you have felt the same way? You know where that comes from? It comes from because we've prayed for people and we haven't seen the miracle. See, healing can be progressive. But if we don't see the miraculous, we hear the enemy go, see, you suck. And pretty soon you come into agreement with him. You're right, I suck. You know, I need a specialist. I'm going to go get somebody who actually gets things happening when they pray. So anyways, sure enough, this guy puts me out with all these people and says, okay, we're going to pray for healing tonight. And my head just went like, oh, got to be kidding. And then he told everybody to line up and find one of the Canadians to pray for them. And the person in front of me has to be a blind woman. And she's so blind, her eyes are like, like it was just not pretty. And I am literally saying to God, oh, come on, couldn't you have given me a bad back? You know, maybe a neck? How about headaches? Those are always good. I think I have faith for headaches, but Lord, this is like way above my pay grade. And he goes, yeah, it's not above my pay grade. And I really, yo, yeah, thanks, Christian. And, but I have heard the enemy say so many times, you suck, you suck, you suck at this. Nothing happens. I had forgotten, I had forgotten that it's God that does it. He's just asking me to be obedient. Anyways, long story short, I, I do everything they tell me to do. I pray the prayer they told us to pray for healing. Nothing happened. So the, then they said, do it again. So I did it again. Nothing happened. So then they said, do it again. So I did it again. Nothing happened. And I'm hearing this voice in my head getting louder. And instead of saying to the enemy, shut up. I'm busy here partnering with God for someone's healing. You need to get behind me. You know, I'm standing here with God. Jolene sang that song about you're standing right here with me in the fire. And instead of telling that voice to shut up, I believed him. And then all of a sudden when I heard God say, this is not above my pay grade. Why are you allowing this to stop you? So I just repented. I said, okay, God, I don't get it. Like there seems to be no change in her. And then he just very quietly says to me, Ask her if she can forgive her father. Ask her if there's somebody she needs to forgive and if it's her father. So I asked her that question. She immediately began just almost howling the pain was so deep. And the two women with her that were her sisters began to howl too. And thank goodness I had an interpreter with me. I thought I'd said something wrong because I was known to do that when I tried to practice Spanish, you know. <laughs> I'm not kidding you, I told an entire pool full of um, people that had disabilities, I thought I was telling them I wanted to pray for them, and instead in Spanish I was yelling emergency, emergency. <laughs> so, 
when I said I thought I'd said something wrong, I was basing that on experience. So anyways, the interpreter said, um, I said, what's going on? Did I say something wrong? And she, so she asked them, why are you crying? Has she said something? And, and so the woman with, whose eyes were blinded said to me, it's my father who blinded me. And I was stunned. And so in that moment, I said, oh God, I'm so sorry. I was so busy looking at what wasn't happening. I was so busy looking at something that was intimidating me that I wasn't asking God, what do you want to do here? I assumed healing meant her eyes. He was about to do a much greater work. And in that moment, we prayed and she forgave her father. Now, of course, I went back into my healing prayer and prayed for her eyes and nothing happened. And I was saying, I started to hear myself say those words again. I suck. And God says, you know what? He said, what is the greater work, Pam? That her eyes are healed or she forgives the one that blinded her? And he says, you need to leave the rest with me. And you, see, that's what so many of us, you count as defeats, that stuff that's not a defeat. If you have done what God has asked you to do, that's not a defeat. The results are in his hands. How many times do we stand and go, remember, oh, sorry, this was part of my class, I guess. But I was going to say, we talked in our class about one of the biggest things you have to worry about is not wanting to be right or look awesome when you're praying for people. You know, it's not about you. It's about letting God flow through you. So there will be times that look like failures. And you know what? It's often because we didn't obey God and ask him, what do you want to do here? But you press on and you keep going. Number 13, he rebukes the enemy for what he's doing. This is the one Alf loves. It's a total of six verses, and each rebuke is in the form of a question, which is a respectful kind of rebuke if we read those other two verses I mentioned at the beginning. Not, it's not about being soft on the enemy or giving him any quarter, but like um, the psalmist, did not bring reviling accusation against the enemy. He was, even though he rebuked him for what he was doing, he was respectful. You know, I hear people saying things, I used to hear people, sorry, say things in prayer meetings that I would just go, oh my gosh, where the heck did you learn to say that? You know, it's like, I'm not afraid of the enemy, but I'm not naive either. He does have power. You know, I have a greater power. I just have to keep reminding him. But I can say to him, I rebuke you. I do rebuke you for what you're doing. Sometimes when you're praying for a neighbor or a friend and you see what's happening in their life, you know, you can say, if God is giving you the authority to pray for that person, just like the centurion who left his sick servant at home, and he said, I understand authority because I too am under authority, you just say the word and my servant who is not here is going to be healed. So when you're praying for a friend or a loved one that's not around you, you need to remember, you can rebuke the enemy and release God to do a work on somebody's life. You can do that. Number 14. Now this is what I need you to understand. Now only six times, what we, in, number four, in number 13, does he directly rebuke the enemy. And 14, only three times out of how many verses? 2,461 verses. Only three times does he directly tell the enemy to go. So he's only talking directly to the enemy a total of nine times out of 2,000 verses, almost 2,500 verses. You need to check your prayer life and figure out how many times are you talking to the enemy and you're not talking to God. Now, I was raised under somebody who, um, you know, they taught us the warfare praying was this constantly yelling at the enemy and shaking my fist at him and, you know, saying nasty things to him. And, um, and that was when I began to realize, man, you know, the whole time I prayed today was all to Satan and not to God. Well, maybe that's why you come out of prayer meetings feeling like, I don't feel great. I don't feel like I really accomplished anything. You know, I feel like I got slimed. Well, that's because you're talking to the wrong person. Talk to the God who says, point out where he is and I'll go destroy him. Point out where he is, I'll go knock his teeth out. You know, point out where he is, and I will deal with him. But only three times did the psalmist directly say, um, 
tells him to get away, and each of those three times he follows up with the word for. And each time the reason he gives involves God. So he's telling him to go, he said, for. The Lord our God will do this. The Lord my God will do this. I'm commanding you to depart now. For my God will take care of you. For my God will destroy you. So you have to remember each time he gets a reason that's involving God. For you are not allowed to dismantle me. You are not allowed to interfere with my destiny. You are not allowed to fool around with my purposes. You know, for God has something up for me. So even in commanding the enemy as little as he does it, he is still centered on God. So the last one is this. A total of two verses, the word fret is used, and it means he's telling people, don't get too upset by the enemy. Because he says the word fret here means to burn or flare up in anger. In other words, don't let the enemy make you lose your cool. If you lose your cool with all of this stuff that's happening around us right now, if you lose your cool, if you lose your peace, if you lose your joy, he's won. He's winning. It's literally like he's coming in the back door and robbing you blind of everything God said is your portion. You know, your portion. What does he say about the kingdom of God is what? Love, joy, peace. And what else? Patience, Patience righteousness. Okay, that's your portion. If you lose your cool and lose your um, focus, those things will not be evident in your life. So he tells the people in the Psalms, you know, don't let the enemy flare you up. So I realize that in choosing these warfare verses and analyzing them with you, it's a bit like a, more of a teaching than a preach, but I hope you understand that I'm trying to be as straightforward as we can be because, you know, we're hearing all sorts of conflicting reports about COVID right now. And so you're going to be challenged to pray. You're going to be challenged to pray for people you hear have COVID. You're going to be challenged to pray for yourself that you don't get it, that your family is safe. You're going to be challenged to pray for the church, for the city, you name it. But regardless, you have to remember these lessons. You know, out of 2,000 verses, you tell God where the enemy is. You let him come and deal with this thing. We call God down into the battle. We remind God, you know, we press our charges against the enemy, yes. But I don't talk to the enemy. I talk to God. So, that, so I want you to remember these three main lessons. Well, I guess there's more than that. Okay, my first main lesson is the psalmist is always very, very God-centered. He's not enemy-centered. Even though he's surrounded by enemies and he talks quite a lot about them, he always directs his mind and his heart and his faith towards God. Warfare praying is mainly talking to God about the enemy. Being God-centered is one of the most basic fundamental principles in praying, and we have to remember that. Number two, the uh, main lesson is the psalmist always asks God to deal with the enemy. So when you go home today, remember these main things. Be God-centered. Let God deal with the enemy. You know, whether it's regarding kings and nations on a strategic, you know, level, or whether it's your own personal enemies, which can really be, that's ground level for all of us, right? You ask God to defeat. You know, you ask God to destroy. 850 verses where he does that, and he only directly addresses the enemy in nine, so that means less than 1% of the Psalms, the warfare verses in Psalms, does he directly put his face into the enemy's face. Now that's David. Uh, I particularly don't want to do that. But you know what? When I need to, I will, because God will give me strength. Okay, the next thing is to remember, just to, if you're look, taking points, is this kind of warfare praying that I'm talking about, it is very aggressive. It's extreme and it's ruthless because we're not holding anything back when we're telling God to go get him. So it's not being passive, it's being very aggressive. And that's where if you want to study, I've got some of the sheets back here, but you don't have to pull your punches when you're praying. So we're being aggressive. The next thing is to remember that this kind of warfare praying that I'm talking to you guys about is powerful. It's, it's showing that God is the source of all authority. He's the source of all power. And we're asking 
the creator God, the omnipotent one, the creator of heaven and earth. We're asking in the name of his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, who is exalted above every principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named. We are declaring his power and authority over every situation. You need to, even just saying that stirs up my faith. And the last one is this. You need to remember this kind of warfare praying is safe. It, there's a lot about God protecting us, about delivering us, about him being our shield and our fortress. We're not being presumptuous. You know, we're not, he's saying hold the line. We don't say, no, I'm going to charge. No, we're not being presumptuous. We're letting God lead us in how we pray. And so you don't rush in where angels fear to tread. Anybody ever heard that verse? It's not a verse, it's a saying. Um, anyways, so with Jesus as your model, I just want you to remember this because I feel like there's so much more for us to learn. So I want to read you Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 18, just in closing, and then I have a little song for you. Do we have the Ephesians 6 verse up on there? Maybe I forgot to bring it. Nope. Yes, there it goes. Christian read that online. And that about wraps it up. And that means my message. Now the boat wraps it up. God is strong. Why don't you read it with me? Just follow me along. And he wants you strong. So take everything the master has set out for you. Well-made weapons of the best materials. And what? Put them to use. So you will be able to stand up to what? Everything that who? The devil throws your way. This is no afternoon athletic contest that we'll walk away from and forget about in a couple of hours. This is for keeps, a life or death fight to the finish against the devil and all his angels. So be prepared. Okay, let's say that again. Be prepared. Okay, so you can't expect different results if you're doing the same old thing, which is like avoiding time with God. You know, not getting to know him. You have to be prepared. So keep going. You're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Take all the help you can get, every weapon God has issued, so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words Learn to apply them, and you'll need them throughout your life. God's word is what? Okay, again, God's word is what? You need to remember that. If you say, I don't like reading my Bible, you know, then spend five minutes, just read one psalm, do something. But his word is a weapon, it's a sword. Okay, God's word is an indispensable weapon in the same way Prayer is in this ongoing warfare. Pray hard and pray long. Okay, I want to encourage you to be strong in the Lord. Put on the whole armor. Stand against the wiles of the enemy. And remember that God is with us. Pray with all prayer. You know, we're in a, a season right now where your neighbors and your family need you to know how to pray. They need you to be standing in all faith and prayer and joy, peace and righteousness. So I'm just going to end with a song, and you can stand up. We're going to just sing this song together. Did we get it up there, um, Christian? Yep. Okay, so everybody stand up. Before he turns the song on, I'm going to just pray for you. And I just want you to go out remembering this song when I say it. So Father, we just ask right now, in Jesus' name, that you would remind us what real warfare praying is. We're not of this world. We're of a kingdom that is literally upside down. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Stir up the word in us. Let it become indispensable. Stir up prayer in us. Let it become essential. And Father, stir up a realization that you have all things under control. So let's just sing this song in closing. And when it's done, God bless you. I'll release you now. When it's done, grab bread, grab books. Grab each other or not. Okay, let's sing. This is how I fight my battle.
This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. That's what we're doing tonight.
showed me that he's doing, he's healing some blindness here today. And that through the airways, God rules the airways. Every time and space, he rules. So if you start to see something new that you haven't seen before in the Lord, then he's healing your blindness. So this is something that happened this week uh, in regards to what happened. Another thing that happened two weeks ago, I felt that God was uh, been up here and has shared that God has shown me that he was establishing the cross and uh, establishing his rule over this city and church and region. And I felt that he was going to give a sign and a wonder to prove that. No, not yet. Okay, good. <laughs> um, after we went from here, we went for a hike, and uh, I'm on this Morning Star Facebook group, and they, every couple of weeks, they prophesy over individual people specifically. And so they picked my name that afternoon after this, and one of the words was this. I saw a picture of your region, and saw a rainbow over that area that you live, and the Lord says that the promises he has given for that region that you live in, that he has not forgotten those promises, that actually in the coming three to six months, there are going to be some strategic promises from the Lord that will come to pass. Things that your church has been praying into, and churches in your region that have been prophesied over the years. And the Lord is encourage, encouraging you that, that the Lord has not forgotten these promises, and many of them are beginning to be fulfilled. So, for the next few days, I was looking for this sign that God had promised. And it didn't come in the first few days, and so I was just wondering, whatever. And uh, it's a, on Monday, this last Monday, it was a sunny day, hardly a cloud in the sky. And I was going out after work, I was going out into my little area where I go to, to be with the Father, to, to come before His presence. And kind of in this, just this way that I do it, I have practically every time, I, I just turn to this specific area where I kind of envision there's this an open portal to heaven, and I just speak, I say, um, hello, heaven. And uh, this particular time I did this, I just walked in on Monday afternoon, I said, hello, heaven, and there was this. This sun halo, this is a rainbow around the sun. This is in our backyard, that's a rainbow around the sun, and all those misty, wispy clouds were coming down through that. And it just, I just started leaping around, there's a, and that was a little, the first picture I took of it. I didn't know my camera could handle facing the sun. So you can see that. And so I believe that was a sign. And that's the rainbow that this other prophetic word of. So praise God. So he's bringing his will to pass. He's bringing promises to pass. Old prophetic words are coming to pass. So bless the Lord. So this morning as I was praying, just another thing. I just felt like I saw in my spirit someone that has really bad headaches possibly over your left eye. I don't know if there's anyone here in the room or online. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, you're sitting in a different spot than I saw you in my spirit. So I saw this needle sticking out of your head and possibly, I don't know, do you have it around your head too or just over? Okay, so that's I saw these needles around your head. So, I don't know, can I... Because of your word, Lord, uh, just by your spirit, I pull out these needles around your head, little white tip needles, pull them out around your head in Jesus' name, and I loose your healing. Now, I don't know what else to say, just be healed and receive the glory. Boom. Pour out your spirit on now. Thank you for releasing it from us in Jesus' name. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> 